Uh, I want to welcome welcome everyone uh, on this webinar uh, to this event. Um, you know, it, it's it's really a wonderful opportunity for us as the club uh, to be able to fulfill our mission. And uh, I frequently say that our mission is simple. It's one of engagement. Um, and what we do is we foster engagement between alums and between alums and MIT. And under these arduous circumstances that we're all dealing with, um, being able to find new ways to fulfill our mission and provide an opportunity for our community to connect um, with each other uh, once again, uh, despite the circumstances, is really you know just just wonderful for us. And once again, I just want to say thank you uh, and welcome to this event. Um, I also want to uh, mention uh, an upcoming event, um, which will occur on Tuesday, May nineteenth. Um, that event will be the club's annual meeting. Um, and during that meeting, we will elect the incoming officer slate. Uh, we will recognize um, our annual SEPT teacher awards. Um, and that is the science and engineering program for teachers, which is oriented toward uh, enhancing, um, providing enhanced educational opportunities for middle and high school teachers. Um, we will also take the time to announce um, the club's outstanding volunteers for the year. Um, and we, you know, I, I've, I've grown into the habit of saying that we have a remarkably strong team and it continues to get stronger. Um, and so if you are interested in joining the club as a volunteer, uh, please reach out to us and uh, we will welcome your involvement. Um, we will also have a guest speaker um, as we usually do. Uh, and that speaker will be Professor Darren Asamoglu. And his topic will be the fragility of liberty and democracy. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to turn this back to uh, Megan Jendrysik, uh, the VP of the Boston Seminar Series. Megan, over to you. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody for, to, um, to coming to this and thank you. This is, um, yeah, this is by, by far the, uh, the most people I've ever been able to fit into, uh, into my dining room. Um, uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would just like to say a quick word of uh, thank you to our uh, sponsor for the Boston Seminar Series, uh, our, uh, Charles Schwab. Um, and uh, when Chuck Schwab founded his company more than 40 years ago, he set out to challenge the status quo with a radical idea that business was here to support the people it served. This idea has been foundational to everything that Schwab has done over this last four decades, even in changing and challenging times. Their dedication to tirelessly grow and provide service to others still stands. Similar to how we encourage the MIT alums to engage in lifelong intellectual and emotional partnerships with MIT, Schwab encourages all of their clients to be fully engaged with their finances and to own their tomorrow. So I'd like to, once again, thank you, Charles Schwab, for your partnership and your support. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys the presentation. Uh, Simon Johnson probably needs very little introduction. He is the, he is the uh, Ronald A. Kurtz uh, Professor of Entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School of Management. He is head of the Global Economics and Management, or the outgoing head of the Global Economics and Management Group and chair of the Sloan Fellows uh, MBA Program Committee. He is co-founder of the uh, very popular uh, Global Entrepreneurship Lab. And over the past uh, 20 years, MBA students in, the, in this lab program have worked on more than 500 projects uh, with startup companies around the world. Uh, he is co-author with John Gruber of uh, Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. And he uh, has, has been on leave as a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for Interna International Economics in Washington, DC. And uh, he uh, left that program to uh, join uh, Liz Warren's presidential campaign. And uh, more recently, of course, he's been uh, involved in the, uh, the COVID Alliance, um, which is uh, what he will be uh, talking about tonight. And he is joining us uh, from, uh, from Washington, DC. 
And so without, uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Professor Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Megan. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and um, very nice to, uh, uh, of David and Megan to extend this uh, invitation to me. And, and actually, you're, you're precisely the, the set of people I'd like to talk with this evening as we enter the second month or have ended the second month, enter the third month of the COVID-19 crisis in the United States and around the world. I plan to speak uh, initially for about 15 minutes. Uh, then we're going to ask you some questions through a poll. Then there's lots of time for question and answer. And then I'll come back uh, towards the end and, and uh, make some additional remarks that will be um, fairly forward looking and, and I hope more upbeat because uh, let's, let's be honest, if we're going to talk about the um, current global situation around the pandemic and its human and economic consequences, which is my initial focus, um, there is going to be some, some downbeat uh, moments in that part of the conversation. The, the topic uh, or the title that we picked for this talk is of course, surviving the second wave uh, of COVID-19 infection. And, and, I, and I would like to um, emphasize that I don't think there is one precise moment of second wave. I think this is about what happens after the initial pandemic, the initial closures or, or lockdowns, and, and uh, as part of our attempt to, to, to recover, there may be infections uh, sooner, they may come later, there may be seasonal concerns. We, we can talk about all of that, and I'm, I'm very interested to, uh, to, hear, your, to hear your views um, and, and to debate with you um, on, on, on those issues. Um, just a, a little bit more about my, my background. Megan did a nice job introducing me. Thank you very much, Megan, uh, on those points. The, the way I introduce myself these days, I say that I, I'm an economist uh, by, by training, a PhD from MIT in 1989, and I worked for 35 years or so uh, on uh, big crises around the world, big systemic crises, economic, financial, uh, political, and actually public health, although this is by far the, the largest uh, set of public health issues I've ever been involved in. I think that's actually true for, for, for everyone. In 2000, 2007, 2008, I was the chief economist at the International Monetary Fund, um, and that was in the in the ramp up to um, what became the global financial crisis. And David reminded me that that I that I spoke to this group actually after the previous crisis, and I'm happy to discuss with you what's similar and what's different between the, those two those two episodes. Um, now I, I work uh, primarily. Most of my days are spent uh, working with the nursing homes, assisted living, and other senior care. Um, particularly in Massachusetts, we also have an active project in, in New Hampshire. And I, I um, advise various people uh, in, 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 that, in that context, in, including Tara Gregorio, who heads that association, and, and various other people um, around MIT, and also um, in, in very, various, parts of, various parts of the government. Or let's, let's say I offer my advice, and <laughs> whether they take it or not uh, may, may, of course, vary, and we can talk about that. Um, but you know, to, to, be, to be clear and to be frank, and I'm sure we'll come back to this at various points in, in, in the discussion, uh, this, the situation that we have lived through in Massachusetts, what we've experienced, and, and particularly what's happened in, in the nursing homes um, and assisted living and, and other congregate living spaces for older Americans is, is really very bad. And, and I would like to um, thank, in particular, uh, my, my colleagues at, at MIT, uh, who uh, I would say rose up with me in, in the COVID-19 Policy Alliance, which we formed uh, almost exactly two months ago. Uh, Retsev Levy and I kicked it off. Retsev had uh, many, if not all, the brilliant um, data-driven and intuitive insights on which we based our work for the subsequent two months. Uh, Kate Kellogg, who's also a professor at Sloan, uh, is embedded with the Massachusetts Senior Care Association and day-to-day -day helping to guide them to safer territory. And then she puts an enormous amount of uh, effort and, and work and thought into that. Uh, Vivek Farias has designed some absolutely brilliant pieces of software in his time, not, none more brilliant than, than the uh, load balancing algorithms that he's developed for healthcare systems uh, around the country. And, and Valerie Karplis, um, who you may have read about in the Washington Post, if you haven't read that story already, do go look it up while I'm talking even, if you, <laughs> I can't even see whether you're not paying attention or subsequently, um, because it is indeed true uh, what they wrote over the weekend, that Valerie um, educated the White House on how to bring more uh, personal protective equipment more quickly and more effectively in, in, into the United States. And that, that is quite an amazing story and, and you should invite her. You should invite all of them to come talk to you. I mean, everything's on Zoom now anyway, so what else are you doing every evening? And, and I'm sure all, all of my colleagues would be happy to come share their perspective with you because they, they all have made amazing uh, contributions. 
the COVID-19 Policy Alliance, which is, is, the, is the heading for our effort, a fairly, a fairly loose, let's say, coalition type of approach, um, is, uh, I, I would describe it as, as MIT from the bottom up. We are not official MIT. We, we were not started by MIT. We started this ourselves with the participation of a lot of uh, students, actually, and, and, and friends and other people uh, around us. And we have uh, focused entirely over, over these two months on reducing the, the human cost from COVID-19. And we were drawn, uh, for reasons that, we, we can, uh, that I already mentioned, we can go into more, uh, to help um, people living in nursing homes and similar senior care facilities. But I'm not speaking on behalf of MIT. I'm not even speaking on behalf of my colleagues tonight. I'm just speaking on behalf of myself, Simon Johnson. Uh, and, and this is, is my assessment of, of the situation globally and, and, and locally um, on May 13th uh, at a quarter past seven in, in the evening. So I, I, I'd like to say or, or speak to three, three questions or three issues before we uh, start to uh, move to the more engaging part of the, uh, and the, and the, the interactive part of the session. The, the, first, the first question is, you know, how, how should we think about what we just lived through from a global perspective? So that's been my background, that's been my experience, that's my work at the IMF. And I'd like to share with you my assessment of, of, of what's happened globally and where things stand globally. Because I think that that actually has a substantial bearing on what could happen and what's feasible in the United States and, and in Boston and elsewhere going forward. The, the second question is, is to try and peel back a couple of layers of the, of the onion and, and ask you, uh, and or or I will posit an answer to the question, and you can come back to me on what exactly is the problem we're trying to solve here? What's the nature of this disease? What's the nature of the risks that it causes? And and perhaps if we think through that together, we can um, calibrate a bit more precisely uh, some of the policy responses that we've already had, and and also some of the policies that we are uh, all trying to develop uh, going forward. And then that will lead me on to talk about the the reopening more specifically, and and how we might think about doing better. Uh, at an individual level, at a, at, a, at a family level, at a company level, at the level of a university, at the level of a state, and, and hopefully at the level of also of a nation. So first question is, wh what did we just live through? How, how should we think about um, th this experience? And how should we think about it globally? Because first, first of all, I mean, I think, I think everybody grasped this to some extent. This is uh, a global crisis. In fact, you, you could argue that it is even more global than the previous so-called global financial crisis because that global financial crisis had its primary impact in countries that had developed financial markets to some degree that had financial connections with the United States where there was a flow of capital back and forth, which is a lot of countries and that's obviously a lot of the world economy, but it's certainly not everyone and it's certainly not everywhere. Well, th this pandemic and th the fear of this virus uh, spread around the world in February, but particularly in early March. And by our estimation, um, at least two thirds of the world's population lives in countries that attempted some form of lockdown, shelter, shelter in your homes, don't go out if you, have, if you absolutely need to, with variations, of course, exactly what they meant. But almost everyone, uh, almost all policy makers around the world attempted some form of lockdown in, in response to the, the initial, let's say, first wave of, of, of the pandemic. Now, that's, uh, that's really interesting and, and very unusual to see such a synchronized policy response. It's also striking that uh, policymakers in parts of the world where they didn't actually have much virus, haven't had much virus so far, also responded with uh, dramatic lockdowns. It's also the case, and, and I'm sure you've seen some of this tragic coverage, that lockdowns were attempted in countries that absolutely um, could not afford uh, for, for many people or most people to, to stay home and not work. So countries that don't have um, any kind of fiscal um, firepower in the, in the hands of the government, no safety net, uh, no savings at the individual level, not significant savings for people to fall back on. And yet these countries tried to slow things down. They tried to um, encourage people to distance themselves. And actually, you know, e even more interesting is when you look at the data we have, I'm sure you've seen some of the um, mobility data that, for example, Google and, and others have made available. What you see there, if you look at the very precise timing, sort of day by day, is even before many of the lockdown orders were issued, people around the world, not everywhere, but in, in many countries, perhaps even most countries, most countries where we have data, they decided to stay home and not go to work and not go out if they could avoid it. So I think what we lived through, uh, and I think we're now coming out of, is honestly a panic. Now, 
what does a panic mean? A panic means when, when everyone decides something bad is going to happen, everyone takes some preemptive action. The, the classic uh, financial panic is, of course, bank run. When people run to the bank and try to get the money out and that proves not to be feasible, you've all seen the movies, and the bank then uh, collapses. Or the bank is provided with some sort of uh, substantial bailout and, and official support, which is, of course, what happened in, in 2008 and, and into 2009 in, in many parts of the world. So this is not that kind of panic. And, and the financial, we can talk about the financial system. But there's, there's definite stresses. Uh, I, I think the authorities' response on the financial side so far has been um, sufficient. Uh, we'll see what happens as we go further in, in, into the um, calculation of the economic damages and the understanding of what comes back and, and what doesn't. Um, but um, the panic is, is, is I think, in, in people's minds with regard to health with regard to the consequences of the virus, with regard to um, being concerned about whether it's going to impact them and their families and, and, and so on. And of course, it's not true that everyone can stay home. Let us be very clear about that. Uh, very important uh, differences uh, in terms of um, the impact of, of um, this virus across people and across different kinds of people. I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to, to explore that uh, dur during the session. But the first and foremost, uh, and, and I think this is very important to sort of understand what we now can and cannot do, is that we're all coming out of this phase where we were, I, I mean, pe perhaps you, you, there are exceptions here and you can feel free to tell us that in the q and A. I I mean, I, I was definitely panicked at some stages. I felt the feelings of panic. I felt fear uh, gripping me. And, and I've been through a lot of these situations and I, I think the best way to deal with any kind of situation is to work really hard. So I worked really harder than I've ever worked. Um, to, to try and uh, get myself and the people around me and the people trying to help through this. Um, but I think that this, this, this aspect of, of fear um, is, 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 is definitely part of what we, we now have to um, hopefully move away from. And, and I would also emphasize that while we did many things and we did some remarkable things and, and we can discuss how much GDP was given up relative to how many lives were saved and so on and so forth. Let me emphasize also that while we we're in that intense phase and difficult phase. Uh, we did not do enough to save nursing homes, assisted living, and other senior care. That's a true statement, I believe, for the United States. It's also a true statement for Europe, and it's a true statement for other places where, where we've looked uh, carefully at the data. I'm sure we could find some exceptions somewhere, but it is remarkable that this complete lockdown, the shutting down of the economic activity, the, the dramatic reduction in mobility, was accompanied by a set of policies that did not adequately protect um, people living in, in these um, protected, um, either state-run or in this case, in, in the United States, largely privately owned um, facilities. And I think that's important to understand that we failed uh, collectively. I mean, my group worked really hard on that and, and we did not achieve what we wanted to achieve. I think we, we had some positive effects, but. I really wish we'd persuaded more people to more action earlier. And I think that's on us as much as on anyone else. Uh, we were insufficiently persuasive, I, I think. So you, could, you can definitely lay that charge at our door. Um, but I, I think it's important that we, we, we put that on, out in the open, on the table, right in front of us right now. Because I don't believe we will deal adequately with the second wave, uh, or third wave, or fourth wave, whatever you want to call it, unless and until we recognize the extent of our collective previous failures at the global level. Now, the second point, which, which in this, this uh, I think you can see why, 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 you'll see why I've teed it up in this way. The second question I wanna to get to is, what exactly is the problem to be solved here? What's the nature of this disease? Who is impacted? How are they impacted? And, and, and why has it done so much damage? Well, I, I think you're all aware at this point that the, the, the let's say the, the secret, the evil superpower of COVID-19 is its profiling so that, that many of us can catch the disease, many of us um, can become carriers or pass it on without even knowing we, we, uh, we have it because we, we could be asymptomatic during that phase of the infection or perhaps throughout the infection. Um, and if the disease reaches vulnerable people, then it will, with a relatively high likelihood, kill them. Now, who are the vulnerable people? It's older people uh, over the age of, well, 
we can discuss what age is the critical age, but certainly over the age of 70 is a substantially higher risk. And, and some people would point at 60, some people would nudge that down low, we can talk about that. Uh, and it's people who have various identified comorbidities, including obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. And then of course, there are concerns about other potential comorbidities that might be added into the mix. Uh, we might come to understand them uh, more fully. The adverse health effects for people under the age of 40 are uh, definitely less. Some people will say that they're not elevated compared to what they had in pre-COVID days. We can we can talk about that. I wouldn't make quite such a strong statement myself, but it's certainly a, there's a, certainly a very strong gradient in terms of the age impact. So if you were to if you were to be um, in a classroom setting at, at an MIT classroom, you know where we 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 have uh, many such um, exercises, and I, I run. Um, a crisis exercise every, every year with the uh, EMBA program, for example, we actually do the Euro crisis, or I have done it in the past, perhaps this year we'll do a rather different kind of Euro crisis. Um, in, in that kind of setting where, 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 you, where you can be dispassionate and, and you can sort of look at it analytically, and, and I show you virus that, that will have devastating effects on vulnerable people, relatively small number of vulnerable people, depending on which part of what we're talking about, and, and a virus that will infect but not harm most people. I think that analytically, if I give you enough time and, and, and I don't disguise the problem, uh, in any classroom setting, uh, a set of smart people like, like yourselves would, would, would come back and say, well, that's obvious, Simon. It's obvious what you should do. You, you should protect the vulnerable. Fort Knox approach to the vulnerable, uh, one of my colleagues likes to call it. So the image is you, you, you put the vulnerable in their homes. And this is actually uh, Retsev's uh, original uh, presentation, the very first days when we started our, our project. Uh, uh, he uh, made a presentation, a congressional briefing to staff, congressional staff and, and journalists and other, other people were there. A and the, the pitch there was, um, I think it, exactly right in, in, in retrospect, that you should find ways to protect um, vulnerable people in their homes, wh where they live, with food, medicine and telehealth. There was, a, I think, it, one idea of says has not been picked up enough, which is well, you, you can't just tell people shelter at home and we'll get back to you later, because a lot of people need medical attention either for existing conditions or because they're worried about having COVID-19 or something else happens. So you have to connect them with the doctor and, and that's much easier to do and much safer to do in, in a pandemic if you do it uh, remotely. So uh, food, medicine and telehealth, where they, where, where, where they are, shelter in place, but for the vulnerable people and everyone else could in principle stay out, stay uh, freer Maybe, maybe in retrospect, we don't say completely free, freer to move, move around the economy and, and, and to go to work and, and so on and so forth. So the, you, you hear a lot of discussion about R, R0, and I'm sure we'll have discussions about, you know, what is R0, how do we measure it? How do we know what it is? Those are all really good and profound questions, by the way. But I, and, and, I, and I'm certainly uh, respectful of, of that discussion and have even contributed to it um, through, through some analytical work we've done. But I would emphasize what really matters is, is the defensive perimeter around, around vulnerable people. If that defensive perimeter is stronger, more of the rest of the economy can, can go about its business and, and you don't have to lose the jobs, you don't have to lose the income. Of course, that's not what we did. We, we did not shut down, uh, protect the vulnerable people and, and let everyone else go to work. No, what we did was we shut down almost everyone. We so thought we locked down, some people thought they locked down the nursing homes, turns out they didn't, right? We could talk about how that happened disease absolutely got into the nursing homes. 60, I think you've seen this headline, just to, just to make sure, 60% of, of COVID-19 deaths uh, so far in Massachusetts were from nursing homes, assisted living and other senior care, 60%. So that's a failure, right? Who went out to work? Who are these essential workers? Well, obviously the healthcare workers, whom we have uh, you know, huge gratitude. Um, and and the, there's many different, um, many very highly educated people in the healthcare sector. Um, and there's also a set of essential workers who are relatively uh, low income, many of whom apparently have gone, had to go to work without sufficient personal protective equipment. That's what the contact tracers tell me. That's where many of the cases are occurring. Um, and, and of course, at the same time, uh, many people are the, who, who can't do their work over Zoom, let's say, have lost their jobs. I mean, in terms of the, the disruption and the devastation to the economy, um, we, 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 nobody, nobody on this call has, has ever seen anything like it. In fact, I, I think even if we had people here who would, who would experience the Great Depression, who were old enough to, uh, 
um, you know, understand the Great Depression as it happened around them. Um, I, I think what we've experienced in the past two months is substantially more traumatic to the economic fabric. And whatever kind of shape a bounce back it is, or recovery, it is not a V. Now, you can take the V right off the table. I mean, look, look at the destruction of small businesses around you. And, and I mean, some of them are, are amazing. Some of them are incredibly heroic. Some of them have struggled through. And, and I only have admiration for all of those people. But it's not coming back in the V. So um, what about the second wave? How do we, if, if this is the right way to think about it, and I'm sure you'll tell me uh, in some detail your reactions, how should we think about reopening? Because, you know, leaving politics aside, there has to be some form of reopening. I mean, honestly, we, we need people that, to, to be able to go back to work and to earn money, including many poor people who've been absolutely crushed by, by, by what's happened. So how do we set things up? How do we arrange our lives and our society and our university, for example, in a way that we can regain normalcy or, or, or maybe regain a slightly the wrong verb, maybe is establish a new form of normalcy or something like that, um, at the same time is absolutely not triggering another round of health crisis. So what would be a health crisis? What, would, what, what is it that, that we must avoid? Well, I think we know that you, you've got to contain the number of new cases. You have to measure what's going on in order to be able to think about where you are relative to uh, cases. And we'll talk about uh, work with, that we've done with um, a pilot surveillance project um, for nursing homes over the past month where we've um, deployed and, and, and um, helped uh, clinicians um, with regard to monitoring the uh, current state of COVID-19 infections in, in, in various nursing homes and assisted living. And, and from that, we've learned a great deal about what works and what doesn't work and also about logistics and also about where to buy test tubes and also where to get swabs printed. Thank you, it, it, the people who make Invisalign, companies called Align for 3D printing some swabs for us, which we then uh, autoclaved on the MIT campus. And thank you, MIT Medical, for donating tubes and saline uh, to transfer media for the specimens. And thank you to the Broad Institute for being amazing and, and helping us with test capacity. So we've worked every single one of these details and, and I am you know, vividly and all too aware of all the pieces that, that, that need to come together uh, in order for a testing program to, to operate, let alone, let alone go to scale. Um, and, and I think that the, the, the good news is that over the next, let's say, um, three months, uh, through June, July, and August, you're going to see a, a ramping up of testing capacity in and around Boston that, that will be impressive, frankly. Mostly focused on virology tests, that's the PCR test to see uh, whether you're currently COVID-19 positive. I also strongly recommend, and we're working very hard to um, help ramp up serology testing uh, in the Commonwealth. I think that is a very important complement to uh, the PCR test, both at the beginning of, of a systematic testing program, because you want to know what you missed with the PCR testing because it wasn't adequate up to this point. So there's a catch-up phenomenon, but there's also this key issue of who has antibodies, does that then confer immunity, how long do those antibodies last? I understand that a vaccine is coming, I'm optimistic it will come. I uh, will ask you a question about when you think it's going to come uh, in, in, in a few moments. I think we should plan for um, the possibility that there'll be some delays. So understanding serology is going to really help us. So we'll have the virology, we'll have the serology. I think we'll also find ways to organize ourselves. And, and this is one reason why I'm so excited to, to talk with you guys uh, tonight, which is, I think, ways in which you um, can restructure your activities, particularly your professional activities, but also your social activities to reduce the risk of infection, to enable productivity, but limit the chances that big infection will spread through our um, communities and, and, and our region. I think that's really, um, really very important. So one idea that's being put forward on, let's say, some university campuses is uh, to explore ways in which we can create um, pods that are, or, or bubbles, or some people call them zones, uh, that are somewhat self-contained. In, in, in Boston biotech firms, some of them, they call it uh, green, team, green team and blue team. So you separate your workforce, you separate your students, and they um, come to school, and, or they come to the lab, but not all at the same time. They don't interact directly with each other. You may even tell them, please, green team and blue team, never meet in person. No inter-team meetings except by Zoom. 
And, and I think what we've learned and are learning and will learn is that there are many such um, improvisations and organizational shifts that can actually be effective in terms of reducing infections. And also if the infection gets into a, a pod or a zone, uh, you can shut it down relatively quickly into a quarantine until you test everyone and find out exactly where the problem is. And you can also do contact tracing within the pod, which is a lot easier, a lot easier to check 65 um, some school students who are working together and, and hanging out together and find out who's infected and find out who, who spent more time with whom than checking 1,300 uh, students across the entire set of programs that Sloan has, let alone, of course, across all of MIT. So finding, uh, these are ideas I'm putting out there for your discussion, okay? Uh, I am not saying that we have cracked this at MIT. I, I, I can tell you we are cranking really hard on this problem and a lot of smart people are coming at it from different angles. And I think we're, extremely uh, focused on solving the problem. And I'll come back at the end and, and in my forward looking uh, pieces, tell you, tell you more about um, some of the things we have in mind and some of the things I'd like to try and engage you uh, all in um, with regard to uh, cross campus activities as we, as we head into the fall. But I think the, the answer on, on the, um, the second wave is we have to do better than we did before, than the past two months. The past two months have not gone well. And, and I think that was because we were taken by surprise. We were uh, not organized in an appropriate fashion. We have plenty of technology. I, I do not believe that South, South Korea, which has done much better, is not totally out of the woods. South Korea has not done better than us because of better technology. They were better organized, better prepared because of some prior, previous experiences and, and, and the way that their um, society is structured, let's say. Um, so we could do a lot better with our uh, existing resources, and I think we have to. And, and I think that the, um, at the level of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, we can and, and, and should have a um, well-designed, fully transparent, uh, real-time surveillance system that enables the governor and the COVID command center and, and others to understand where is the infection currently, to understand whether it threatens particular um, cities or, or regions, to know where it is relative to vulnerable people. Because I, I am going to go on and on about this, I'm afraid, until basically the end of time, which is if you protect the vulnerable people more effectively, you don't have to lock down your economy as dramatically, even, even, even on a local basis, if, if that's what you're doing. Um, but in order to, in order to uh, protect the vulnerable people, you have to uh, be able to monitor their situation. You have to be able to understand exactly what's going on in individual nursing homes and in, the set, in, and in all nursing homes. And, and we have um, previously lacked that real-time data ability and the ability to apply any kind of analytics uh, to the data, the kind of work RedCEP does. That, that's not been possible uh, to do effectively and quickly uh, to this point. So we have to change that. I mean, I think we obviously have to change that. Uh, I think that in, in an analytical, moderately dispassionate discussion like this one, well, well, let's see where you go, but I think that's the direction in which we're going to go. Um, of course, in, in, in the real world, I understand <laughs> there's a lot of politics. I was at the IMF, remember, for quite a while, and, I, and, and politics in Massachusetts and, uh, uh, resembles quite, uh, quite a bit politics on the international stage, I, I can assure you. But, you know, a, a lot of people want to solve this problem. I, I don't think anyone wants to close the economy down again. I don't think anyone wants to sacrifice Americans. I really don't. Uh, and I think the question is figuring out how to do that in a, in a practical, analytical way, using our science, using our technological capacity, and, and uh, reorganizing ourselves to some degree until the vaccine comes. And by the way, once the vaccine comes, it's not over. There's a set of issues about who gets the vaccine, how we deploy the vaccine, how long the vaccine lasts. I think that phase is relatively straightforward compared to what we're, what we're in now, let alone what we've been through. But it's still a phase that, that, that we have to... Um, plan on and, and, and work around. Uh, the first question we have is um, Robert Asher's. I saw in the local paper that hospitals were sending COVID patients back to skilled nursing homes who were compelled to take them if they had an empty bed. Didn't this lead to the rising death rate? Aren't seniors being ill-treated by these policies? It is certainly the case that um, if you put COVID-19 positive patients into a facility uh, that has um, other patients who are not COVID-19 positive, uh, that uh, is asking for trouble. Um, certainly, what 
and, and there are documented instances where that happened in New York State, I believe. At least what I personally uh, have observed in Massachusetts was um, some nursing homes were uh, the, the, the pre-existing residents were moved elsewhere so they could become COVID-19, um, places where COVID-19 patients could be sent. So I have not seen the story. If you want to send it to me, I'll look at it and I'll talk to the journalists. I think the, the situation you described would be a very bad idea. I don't believe that has been at the top of the list of our problems in Massachusetts. We have had many other problems. Claude Gersel, so aside from preventing inundation of the medical system in the absence of vaccine or ameliorating medicines, does pushing down on the, on the curb have any effect on the overall death rate? Uh, when we do have a lockdown, shouldn't it be only for people at an increased risk until the medical systems are getting too busy, at which point others can go into lockdown? Yeah, I think that algorithm, the, what you just proposed, if I understood it correctly, would be uh, uh, quite, quite a good one. And maybe that should be the basis of what we do going forward. Uh, was that Claude asking the question? Uh, that was Claude, yes. Yeah, so Claude, I, I like that idea. I, so let me just restate it and make sure I got it right, which is that the, the primary protection, I, I prefer the word protection than lockdown, by the way. I think lockdown sounds a little bit negative when I'm talking about older Americans. I think uh, some form of protection or Fort, Fort Knox strategy um, is um, the way I would put to describe it. And, and these people would be protected as much as possible. They would be um, certainly advised uh, to um, stay away from other people. They would be, uh, to the extent they needed help with groceries or medicine or access to doctor through telehealth, that would be provided to keep them away from everyone else. Okay. Um, and, and I think that if you do that successfully, um, then you have a good chance of limiting the number of new cases and limiting the number of people who need to be hospitalized. And it is, you're quite right, Claude, the number of hospital beds and the pressure on the ICU and obviously pressure on ventilator capacity and so on, you know, all know all about that. Th th those are the critical constraints. So if it were the case that you were, or the governor, were again to feel that we were very close to running out of hospital capacity, then you have to urge people to go back to their homes and, and not interact more broadly with each other. Um, but it is, it is the, in, the, the way in which the infection spreads among relatively healthy people and reaches the unhealthy people or the older people, the people who are vulnerable, that's the key piece. That's the linkage we have to break. And, 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 and I really believe we haven't broken it. Despite all our efforts, despite all our sacrifices, or the sacrifices, I mean, I, I frankly have not made huge sacrifices, but a lot of other people um, in, in the society have made huge sacrifices. Despite those sacrifices, um, I, I don't think we broke that linkage so far. One more question, we're into the very dark. Uh, Leslie Markham asks, is there any thought about what, an, an, in quotes, acceptable infection rate and or death rate would be for COVID in order to return to whatever our new normal will be? For example, if we get to the same rate as for seasonal flu, would that be a reasonable guideline before a vaccine at least? Yeah, I, I don't know that, I think that's an interesting question, Leslie. I think, it, I think it's quite a hard one. I think. The, and, and, and I don't know that we will know the uh, infection and mortality rate, which is the key number. I don't think we're gonna know that until afterwards because n not all the deaths are recorded under, under the circumstances. And, and we certainly have not measured, um, to date, not measured infection uh, very well because we, we don't have a lot of testing and, and we haven't been doing random sampling of the population and, and so on. Um, I, I do think that uh, new cases is gonna be the key variable to look at. And I think it's the keeping new cases down uh, or, or not allowing you, new cases to spike up is going to be seen just from an operational perspective as the key variable uh, on, on, on which to focus. Um, you know, afterwards, people will go back and make comparisons, see how many people died uh, in, in this episode relative to a, a bad seasonal flu episode. And it, it will certainly, I think, be more than a bad seasonal flu, but I'm not sure how much more. That, that is definitely to be determined. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to second guess what was done already because um, there was a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty. And by the time, I think there was some slow, there was a slowness to react among officials. I think that's fair. Um, and, and, but that was a fairly general uh, ph phenomenon, except for Asian countries that had, had previous experience with SARS and MERS. Um, so I think that the, um, the, the lockdown reaction was, was understandable given the uncertainty. Now, though, the uncertainty is, 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 re is reduced, uh, Leslie, and I think now it's safer to focus on cases and focus on um, 
hospital beds and also try to build um, a proper data, uh, a view on the data both at this moment using the virology and the serology and, and also going forward to sample and, and to watch carefully that they were not generating more cases and more hospitalizations, right? Because again, it's from the, from, from uh, it, infection is one thing, but it, does, it, does it reach the vulnerable people? That's the, that's the key variable. And some of the vulnerable people live in the community and it's harder to protect them. So that, that is, I think, the, the big picture. All right, do you think we had, a, do you think everybody, everybody who wants to vote has voted? Again, it seems- I think everyone who's wanted to vote has, has right. voted. Um, right. Let's see, let's see what, so the first question was, I'm going, to, I'm going to, I think if I end the poll, it will, uh, you think it'll let me see it? Okay, you end the poll and then let me look at the results. Yes. There we go. Okay. okay. All right. So what percent of people in Massachusetts do you think have been exposed to COVID-19 and survived? So th this is obviously a, a, a really uh, important question because it tells us w whether uh, we are anywhere near to herd immunity. Herd immunity, as, as I'm sure you're aware, I mean, depends on what you think our naught is, which again, we, we don't know, but if it's around 2.5, then herd immunity, the, the headline number is 60%, although there's usually overshooting these kinds of dynamics, so you might have to get up to something like 70%. If our naught is higher, then, then you'd go to a higher, um, you'd expect herd immunity at a, at a higher number. So most of you think that um, we haven't had, uh, uh, we, that, we're, that we're relatively low, uh, less than 45%, so some distance from herd immunity. And the most common answer is 15%. Um, I, I actually think if, if it's Massachusetts, I mean, who knows, right? This is the problem with not having data. But I, it would not surprise me if uh, if we take Massachusetts on average, it's closer to 5% than 15%. We, we, will, we will find out uh, at some point. Um, of course, there are places within Massachusetts, places within the greater Boston area, where the uh, rate is almost certainly higher. Although some of the reports, I'm, I'm not sure, been, some of the studies may be not uh, ideal or fully documented, but you, you're basically saying here that there's a, there's a lot more to come in terms of uh, potential infection um, if we, um, when and if we, we release the economy from, from the lockdown. So that's something that we, that we need to be aware of. But by the way, I think about half of the world's population lives in countries that will de facto um, go to herd immunity because they don't have the ability to suppress the economy through lockdown, they don't have other tools. So maybe 3.5 billion people in the world are gonna get herd immunity over some period, perhaps it's six months or nine months. 3.5 billion people live in countries like ours where we try to suppress it, waiting for a vaccine. And then a number of people live in, in relatively small countries, particularly islands and, and countries where you can um, limit the in, incoming uh, visitors like Australia and New Zealand. And those places I think will eradicate um, the virus from from their own um, from their own territory. You know, one uh, consequence though is going to be a lot of restrictions and concerns about international travelers because countries that have eradicated the virus don't want people to show up who might bring the virus, and we are going to be vulnerable. If let's say this fifteen percent holds here, we're going to be vulnerable to international arrivals coming and, and not being properly quarantined and not being tested, and that releasing the infection anew. So I think travel. Of, of certainly a short-term kind is going to become quite difficult. When do you think a second wave of infection is likely to hit Boston? Well, I, th I think um, many of you are concerned about what happens in the next um, few weeks because the, the governor has said that he will um, move us in the direction of reopening next week. I think in the, in the weeks that follow that, we'll see more attempts to open different pieces and, and um, there's a lot of concern with the immediate threat, uh, let alone waiting until um, later, later in the year. I think that's probably quite realistic. Uh, and when do you think we'll have a vaccine with production at scale? So in other words, not, not just the existence of a vaccine, but a vaccine that we can, um, that, that will help us, you know, uh, change what we do and go back to something closer to what we had before previously. So a lot of people talk about a vaccine at the end of the year. I, I, I share your skepticism about that one. I think um, May 2021 is an answer I, I offered here. And I see that just was beaten out by December 2021. And of course, I didn't give you any options between May and December. So I think it, it looks like the second half, towards the second half of 2021 um, in, in your uh, collective wisdom, which I would, uh, again, generally agree with. What other questions do we have, Megan? 
<clears throat> Here's a very good question. We can probably talk about for the rest of the evening. Uh, Bob Schreiber asks, uh, do you think we can be truly successful when roughly 40% of our population believes that this is a hoax at worst and a gross imposition on personal freedom at best, leading to abject refusal to maintain proper protections? Add to this the relatively significant percentage of, of uh, persons who are anti-vaccine. Our country is so different culturally than countries like Germany and South Korea that it seems we just cannot succeed. Uh, well, I think all of those are definitely complicating factors, Bob. I think uh, you're totally right about the difference between this country and other countries, and it does seem this virus has sort of sought out and, for and, and found every single weakness we have in our social fabric and in, in our um, attitude. Um, you know, I, I think the, the key, in, in, in the opinion of, of some medical professionals going forward, is going to be to maintain some reasonable social distancing uh, not to get too close to each other, to be careful about how we interact, and particularly to wear masks. I, I think uh, cloth masks, not taking medical uh, PPE away from healthcare professionals, very important, including for the nursing homes. When we when we ran out of PPE, uh, or almost ran out of PPE early in the crisis, it was the nursing homes who were hardest hit because they, they were lower down the pecking order with regard to suppliers, and they were slower off the mark and less important in the eyes of various um, state officials. And then that was why we got so involved in, in bringing PPE to the, to the US, and that's why we spent time with the White House and helped the White House uh, get that right, because we wanted more to come to the nursing homes. And uh, you know, it's kind of a long story about exactly what happened, but it, it worked to, 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 to some degree. But I think cloth masks and other, um, other ways to increase capacity, uh, that's gonna be important. But if people won't wear masks on public transit, for example, that I, I believe is going to complicate many many, many factors. Whether you have to wear masks in, in, inside, whether uh, there are, there, there are if, if you're able to socially distance, be socially distant, you need a mask at the same time. Those, those are very good questions that people are still gonna, are still experts are still grappling with. Um, but I think to your, to your points, Bob, uh, we, I think we can do better and we can uh, achieve some success, but the fact is you identify it, um, absolutely make it more difficult. A question about a recent editorial in The Economist said it's a mistake to keep schools closed given that children seem to be not as impacted by the virus, uh, given the negative long-term impact on their development and economic opportunities, particularly among the poor, from the lack of proper schooling, and given the fact that we can't restart the economy while the kids are still at home. would love to get your opinion on this. Yeah, I, I, I read that piece in The Economist. I thought it was very powerful and, and, and quite convincing. You know, I think from the perspective of public health officials, they are not yet entirely convinced that the children are either completely safe, you've seen news reports, obviously, there's concerns there, and this issue of can the children transmit it? So can they move it, can it go from one child to another child and then go back to a household where there's a vulnerable person living in the household? You know, we, we think that the, this, the risks here are low, but we're not absolutely sure. And I think this is, a, this is the consequence of having been panicked as a, as a people, right? Which is that, it is quite hard to sort out the statistical, well, we may know what the statistical reality is, but, but, but um, focusing on decision-making on that and making that and, and, and having it be politically legitimate just to focus on, on that is kind of hard at this moment. So I, I completely agree with what The Economist said. I think this is one of the, one of the most unfair parts of this incredibly unfair experience is, is that you know, children um, from families who don't have good internet access or who go to schools that don't have, um, good facilities or, or an ability to transition to distance learning, they've really been hard hit. And these are long lasting consequences and, and you don't make it up later. So reopening schools as fast as you can, I think that should be in, an important priority, but we have other important priorities and, and we worry about the, the, the knock-on effects on, on, on health as, as we've been discussing. So it is to be determined who prioritizes that. In, in, in Israel and Norway, the ch school children have gone back and it's true for some classes also in Germany. And, and I think as, if we can get past this initial stage of reopening, I, I personally would be hoping we can do that in, in Massachusetts quite soon. Uh, question very, very uh, close to home. Um, Renee Robbins asks, what do you see as the prospects for MIT and other colleges and universities to resume operations in the fall? How do you control risks across a community like a university that is multi-generational and also has a large residential population? 
Yeah, that's obviously a, a question we're spending a lot of time on, uh, Renee. Oh, California but, just uh, said that, I think UCAL just said they weren't going to have classes in the fall, uh, in live classes. In the, 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 I saw the California State University said they weren't going to have, um, they, they were going to be just virtual in the fall. You know, I, th I think, Renee, it's a very important question, and it's obviously one that matters a lot to, to us at MIT. I think that um, you, you succinctly identified the issues. You have multi-generational uh, presence on campus. There are people with comorbidities of various kinds. They have to be protected. Um, at the same time, if we can figure out how to have more of activities in person and have them safe with regard to both the people who are on campus and the broader community, right? So we mustn't allow MIT to become a, you know, a, a node in the network that transmits a lot of infection to vulnerable people. I, I think that we should try um, to have as much of our um, in-person activities um, and, and the, the traditional structure of the university and the, the, the way in which people, students learn from each other as well as from professors. I think we should try and, I personally think we should try and um, reboot as much of that as possible. But I think we have to reorganize. I, I, I think that um, this is the um, proposal on, on pods or zones, which I'd be happy to, to circulate through, through Megan and David subsequently, if you're interested, um, to actually think about ways in which you can have the students uh, say, take their lab courses, because I think those have to be done in person, and also live together with the people who are taking that set of courses and attend other courses virtually. So they, 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 you could have 30 or 50 or 65 people in a pod, and that pod could have plenty of social interactions, but you would tell the people in that pod, or, or you would ask them to own the idea that interactions with other pods are relatively risky and to be discouraged. And, and I think personally at this moment that MIT undergraduates will rise to that and will help us work out the details uh, because you can get a better education and you can protect people and you can have fairer outcomes, frankly, for, for, for more people if you do it right. But of course you have to be pretty disciplined about it. And one super spreader, I mean, you, you've seen news reports, I'm sure of what happened in South Korea, where one super spreader um, is based on behavior and based on mingling with a lot of people and based on networking or whatever you want to call it of a kind that used to be pretty standard. But now one person can affect 125 people in an evening, right? So college campuses have to be, have, people on college campuses have to recognize that reality and take it on board um, and, and behavior would need to change, and organization needs to change. But I, I don't think this is the hardest problem that MIT has ever worked on. I don't think this is the biggest organizational change that, that, that uh, MIT or other places have ever, have to, ever had to confront. It is a different one, it is a new one, and it is something that involves everyone. So we'll see how we get on. I think though, there, there is a great desire to, 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 to get to a better place and to get to better outcomes, and not just to retreat into a shell, which, which was, that, that shell, that lockdown was very bad for many people, and we must not forget that. I'm going, I'm going to sort of um, lump some questions about uh, vaccines and herd immunity together. Um, questions there, uh, there's some indication that people who have uh, recovered from COVID do not develop lasting immunity. Uh, what does that imply about, what does that tell us about the possibility um, the likelihood of developing a, an effective vaccine? Um, and the question is, uh, have, have we ever achieved uh, herd immunity without an effective vaccine? And uh, what, exactly is the what exactly is the difference between herd immunity and, um, and simply having the vulnerable among the population dying off? What is the distinction? Yeah, so, so let's take the last question first, which is, so let's take a country well, I don't want to pick on any country in particular. Let's take, let's take a country like India, which is clearly, you know, has a healthcare system that's trying really hard, but is almost certainly not going to be able to suppress the virus like we have, and they're not going to be able to eradicate it like New Zealand. Um, so what's going to happen there, uh, you know, and, and obviously this is conditional on uh, what we know about uh, how climate affects the transmission of, of the virus, which is it may affect it, but not that much. So what will happen in, in India, uh, presumably, is that you will have a, a high percentage of the people, uh, everyone, when I say people, 60, 70 percent of the population will uh, get the infection and will, many of them will survive, so it depends on who gets the infection. And, and it, you could imagine a world in which, uh, obviously this is difficult, but a world in which all the vulnerable people in India are protected and the people who get the infection are the people who are relatively, relatively young. So at that point, you haven't, 
eradicated the disease typically. Uh, it usually lingers and something this infectious, uh, many people believe will linger for, linger for a long time, but it doesn't have the um, epidemic, explosive epidemic dynamics. So it can't, you can't have a, a sudden sweep through, through the, um, through through the population uh, like you had now. So R R naught in in the in the lingo in the jargon R naught is is below one uh, once you once you reach herd immunity. In fact, that's the definition. Um, now, if you have the vaccine, of course, what you can do is vaccinate uh, vulnerable people. And there's going to be a very interesting set of questions coming to us soon, assuming we're successful with the vaccine. Uh, who should get vaccinated in in what order? And personally, I, I would be recommending that uh, vulnerable people. Subject to understanding the, the 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 costs and benefits of the vaccine, and to what extent it's dangerous, all vaccines have some potential side effects that have to be considered. Um, I, I would I would I would hope and expect that we can prioritize vulnerable people because remember, if we protect the vulnerable people, we don't care anywhere near as much about the overall infectiousness of the disease. So I, I think that um, some countries will go to herd immunity because they have no option. They will still benefit from the vaccine. We are very unlikely to uh, want to go to herd immunity, particularly because we're not going to protect vulnerable people. You know, actually, by the way, even Sweden, which they don't like to use this term, and I do think they had some suppressing measures, including more from the behavior of their people than from what the government required them to do. But even in, in, in Sweden, there is an unacceptable, to them, level of deaths in nursing homes. So even Sweden, which, which had a relatively, let's say, different approach, did not manage to protect the vulnerable people sufficiently. So that, that we have to recognize that, that um, weakness in, 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 all, in all our systems. Um, on, on the issue of would we get, do you get lasting immunity from, um, well, either from the vaccine or from the um, having had COVID-19, the um, immunologists argue about that. Sometimes I like to get them in a room and just watch them argue. It's entertaining for half an hour. You learn a lot. I'm not an immunologist, but I would say that the consensus is you get, there might be some rare exceptions, but they seem pretty rare. You get some period of immunity, which is typically going to be manifest in antibodies that can be detectable in your blood. That's the point of astrology. You get some period of immunity after having had the disease and after being vaccinated, but we don't know how long. And it would be unwise to bet, uh, certainly on, on the immunity after you've had COVID-19, it's unwise to, to, to bet too much on being immune for more than six months. The vaccine, we don't know. We don't know the properties of the vaccine yet. Um, we, we do know it's one of the largest, uh, best organized enterprises in American pharmaceutical history. So I have great confidence in private capital and its ability to invent stuff when they are really focused. Um, and it's possible that this virus won't make, mutate much. And that's again, what some of the experts feel right now. But this wasn't the first coronavirus, so why would it be the last? And, and this coronavirus secret power was targeting uh, older people and, and, and people with comorbidities and, and using the, most of the rest of us as potential vectors. But the next coronavirus um, could target it and profile in a different way. What if the next coronavirus profiled young, young people or even children? Right. So I, I don't think we're done. This is I, I believe we 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 everyone on this Zoom lives now and will always live in the post virus world. I, I don't think this is even like, you know, the financial crisis of 2008, which seemed big at the time. And you look back and you say, well, it was traumatic. A lot of people lost their jobs. You know, we did some financial reform. Basically, our social structure and our, and our view of the world remained the same. I mean, I, I would I would say that. Um, my view of the world, let's just speak personally, is completely different. I, I, I grew up believing um, that science had vanquished the natural environment and, and that infectious disease on a mass epidemic, global pandemic scale was a thing of the past. And, and I, you know, if anything, I thought that perhaps we'd overdone it a little bit on the science and technology and perhaps we'd overheated the planet and needed to back off a little bit. You know, I was wrong. Turns out we haven't vanquished the natural environment. Turns out our most uh, vicious, and, and, and effective and evil enemy is, in, is among us right now, right? That, that, that I would suggest is, is, requires a very fundamental shift in, in our thinking about economic policy, social policy, health policy, who we are as Americans relative to other countries. And that's going back to the point, uh, point made earlier by, by, uh, by Bob, for example. 
I, I think it all has to be questioned and examined um, if we're going to survive and, and hopefully even prosper what, what seem like to be potential multiple rounds of, 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 of coronavirus um, with, with, with deadly consequences. Say a, a question um, from a, uh, can my employer, in this, in this case, uh, the US government, but um, I'd be curious for this, uh, for any, any employer, uh, require me to take an antibody or serology test? Uh, and who would, who would see that data? And what actions would they be allowed to take in terms of my employment, uh, telework, stay at home, et cetera? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and I think that is the, the full answer is, is to, be, to be determined. Uh, there's obviously um, you know, some uh, public health uh, requirements that might uh, yeah. take precedence in, in some situations like, like, like this one. Uh, and, and there's certainly, uh, everyone I talk to is very keen to preserve privacy and to not um, compromise um, you know the, the integrity of uh, individuals' data, or, or allow them to be discriminated against, and, and so on and so forth. You know, at the same time, if um, somebody wants to come into a relatively confined space where we breathe uh, the same air and we stay together for several hours, um, and, and with or without a mask, you know that creates uh, potential hazards for other people. And so, I think that there may well be uh, norms and expectations, and, and even uh, potentially rules um, about who can come into a building, on what conditions they can come into the building, and, and what happens if, if they uh, don't want to comply with those with those with those requirements. Um, I mean, personally, I, I hope that that people are highly protected and and, and um, well treated throughout this situation. And I think to the extent people can telework or they can take classes virtually, and and we can find ways to to manage that in an equitable fashion, that's good. But let's be honest, again, some people don't have that luxury. It is a luxury. And some people need to come to work in person. And there are spillover effects, right? There are spillover effects when we see each other, when we greet each other, when we're close to each other. And um, there's a balance of interest that is, without question, a difficult legal and, and political matter that I, I, I don't think we've even started to scratch the surface of, let alone resolve. Then, uh, 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 Shailish Gongal? Apologize if I mangled the name. Uh, for some indus industries, such as aviation and other forms of public transit, maintaining social distance upends the business model. If enough people do not board an airplane or a bus, the service provider loses money. It is also impractical. For instance, an aircraft cabin is 12 feet wide and buses tend to be about eight feet wide. How long do you think social distancing will be in place? And how do you think these industries should tackle this conundrum? Oh, th those are, I think, some of the most difficult practical issues including, um, you know, the, the, I'll come back to aviation in a moment, but, but, but buses and metro, if you want to restart uh, the economy of, of um, many large cities, including Boston, obviously, and, and certainly New York, um, then you need to run uh, a lot of trains. Um, and perhaps in some places, it's not possible to fit all the people who need to get on that train, uh, on the train, um, and, and subject uh, to... Um, and comply with the current social distancing guidelines, which are that you should stay six feet away from other people. So I think here the question is going to be what kind of masks people have and other personal protective equipment, and to what extent, and it's an open, it's a question, um, to what extent that protects you when you come relatively close to people, including in situations right in the subway. I have not yet seen um, good analysis of that, let alone um, any clear statement by, by policymakers that I think people are going to line up behind. So very big question. Look, aviation um, has got a big problem because not, not only is, is there the social distancing, distancing issue, which, which you're asking about, but also who actually wants to travel? Who wants to go anywhere, right? If, if there, are, there are Canadian provinces right now which have a quarantine requirement if you go from one province to the other. Uh, so, and, and there are parts of British Columbia, in fact, I think this may be even the statement uh, by some authorities in British Columbia saying no foreigners for a while. What, until a vaccine? Well, you guys said vaccine is 12 to 18 months away. So, and, you know, I, I'm not sure the, that airlines are going to have a lot of passengers and a lot of people wanting to go places. Um, it, it Maine, I believe, Maine, which isn't Maine, Maine Maine's uh, tagline, vacation land? They said vacation land, but go into quarantine for two weeks when you get here. 
Yes. <laughs> right. So I think that aviation has got a, a very big problem, and um, presumably we can develop remediation measures, and can presumably there's a there's a masking uh, um, policy that can work and can help. But I, I agree with the with the questioner that packing people in tightly into economy does not seem like a good idea, or even consistent with other public health standards, uh, unless and until we have a, a vaccine. Right. Um, speaking of uh, state quarantines, uh, Robert Gurnitz asks, can an uncoordinated effort, i.e. each state doing its own thing, get us to a solution? <laughs> well, I think, Robert, that's all we have. So, I mean, honestly, of course, it would be better to have a federal policy. And, and that's why Retsev and I were in the White House, or virtually in the White House, making pros of the White House in the first weekend of our, of our work together. And it was um, the uh, disappointing response, let's call it, from the White House that, that uh, drove us to work at the state level, which is where we've been engaged for two months. Um, I, I think that uh, the states can do a lot. I think many governors have rallied around this. I don't think it's a partisan political issue. I think it's a question of who can find what sort of solution and also what can we learn from each other and, and where will the mistakes be made and where will good steps be, sensible steps be taken and how do we learn from that? Um, so I, I think we can get to a fairly good place with state by state action. And I, and I am encouraged by many of the things I see currently at the top uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and we've, we've just got to make do with what we have, Robert. I mean, I, I don't think there's any other option. Uh one from Jerry Gector. Uh, how much aggressive uh, contact tracing would you, do you advocate? <laughs> well, depends what you mean by aggressive. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the story, the, the, um, the, the people who've looked at this carefully uh, report that in, in Korea, when you call people up uh, and, and say, you know, you've been, infect you've been infected with the contact tracers, we want to know who you spent time with, they, they will tell you uh, what, what, where they've been and you can unravel pretty much every, all, all of their contacts. So that's the Seoul nightclub example, which we've all seen in the news the last few days. Um, in the United States, when you call people up and, and say, we'd like to know where you've been, half the people hang up on you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know what aggressive means. I mean, if people won't tell you, 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 you people won't tell you where they've been, I don't think you're gonna be, you know, there are, are as I'm sure you've all seen, opt-in solutions, including, including a couple of clever ones from MIT, Ron Rivest and Danny Weiss, the head of team, uh, that has some interesting technology, but it's all opt-in. You know, you opt in to have your cell phone track other cell phones uh, with which it makes contact through Bluetooth and, and then go back. If you're found to be COVID-19 positive, it'll go back and notify the owners of that phone in an anonymous way. Um, and, and privacy is still preserved. But that's opt in. Right. You, you, I don't think and this is to your, to your point, Megan, about, you know, I, if you if you want to come into my building and my building is, is secured in a certain way, I, I think I have the right to, to require you to wear shoes and a shirt. I mean, that's what they say on the door, right? Or, or to, um, to attest that you're symptom free. Or to even let me do a thermal scan of your temperature as you walk in the building without touching you, you know, just like they do it, uh, if you see that at Asian airports, it's long been a standard thing. So that, that's, if you're coming to my building um, I, I, and it's a physical contact, I think that, that I think those things will be regarded as acceptable. I think they are acceptable already actually. But can I require you, Megan, to register your cell phone in a certain way and disclose your data to other? No, I don't think I can. I think that would be unfair and unreasonable and intrusive. And, and so we're not going to do that. It has to be opt-in. So I don't think, I don't think aggressive is an, is, is, is an option. I think uh, persuasion is, is, is an option and, and trying to get to high enough voluntary compliance. I am skeptical that contact tracing will be so important in this country compared to other countries. Okay, let, let me let me pause the questions just one second, Megan. Let me. I just want to say a few more things because uh, I want to make I want to get some positives uh, out there because I you know I think there's good questions and uh, not entirely negative, but I wanted to be a little more forward looking, a little more positive. So I, I think that the obviously we're in we're in this survival phase and, and a reboot phase for for the economy, and these things are going to be with us for for some time, and there's going to be considerable difficulty. Um, but then what happens? How do we get growth back in the economy? And what kind of economy do we, do, do we have? What, what let me put it this way. What drives growth going forward in 2021 or 2022? Well, I don't think it's going to be globalization uh, because we're going to be reassessing global supply chains. We're not going to want to run uh, critical supply chains across international borders. It was, you know, in, in some sense, fortunate 
that the Chinese pandemic had ended by the time our pandemic got bad because we were able to buy PPE from China. If their pandemic had continued, which it could well have done, right? I mean, that was just, it's a question of how effective various measures are over what time frame. Um, we wouldn't have been able to buy any PPE from them. No, it wouldn't even be worth asking. So you have to have a domestic supply in order to make that work. And in order to do that, you're going to have to uh, shift the basis on which people trade, either through tariffs or non-tariff uh, measures or barriers, if you want to be quite candid about it. And, and that's not, that's probably a good idea. It's certainly a good idea. It's certainly, I, I would suggest even unavoidable, but it's not the, the kind of globalization drives growth business that we've, that we've seen um, in, in recent decades. I'm also skeptical that private investment is going to be a big factor because I think the degree of uncertainty that's been created uh, by the disease and by the policy response and then by the on off, you know, not knowing what the federal policy is, that makes things very difficult. If, if the reopening goes smoothly, you know, maybe we have a shot, more private sector comes back. Um, but if it's bumpy, which is what uh, many of you seem to think, then I think that's going to be difficult for um, with regard to encouraging investment, for example, and encouraging the development of new technology. So what else do we have? And, and why, do I, why am I at all uh, optimistic or positive? Well, <laughs> okay, I'm not really trying to sell my book to you, but I, it, we do have a book, John Gruber and I, that we wrote last year called Jumpstarting America. Um, and there's a website called jumpstartingamerica.com where you can go look at our analysis and look at the places we flagged as being potential next generation tech hubs and arguing that, oh, there we go, here's the title, how breakthrough science can revive American growth and the economic growth of the American dream. So this argument that John and I were making a year ago, invest more in R&D, have a government investment that acts as a catalyst for the private sector to invest and to follow on. Um, that got some traction, but I have to admit, not a huge amount of traction because other things happened. And now I find a lot more people interested in it because, and I'm, I'm, okay, I'm not saying that you get a big additional amount of spending on it right now because there are obviously competing demands. But if you want to create growth and you want to create, expand the economy, you want to raise productivity, you want to create good jobs, right? So uh, we, we said the, the, the kind of program uh, that we were proposing in, in the book uh, would generate 4 million good new jobs over you know, a number of years. Um, and people say, well, that's interesting, but we're at nearly full employment. So why is that a priority? Well, we don't just need 4 million good jobs. Now we need 20 million good jobs immediately, right? So I don't promise science can do all of that, but, but this is, um, you know, the equivalent, or if this is, you know, some people say, is this like 1940, Van Eva Bush realizes we need to do a big scientific push in the US, or is it 1957, 1958, Sputnik has been launched, and, and Eisenhower realizes you need to do a big scientific push, and, and a whole, you know, reworking of American education, and so on. And I say it's both together, right? It's a massive enemy, which is technologic, which has got a technology or needs to be counteracted by, by, by a massive deployment of our existing technology. And we need to invest in new stuff to anticipate the risks and the dangers that are going to come that we have not yet seen. So let's do it all. And where should you do it? Well, I mean, you should do it everywhere that wants to do it. I mean, we, we have no shortage of, of places and people in the United States right now who want uh, investment and who want more good jobs. And I think there's going to be an interesting conversation about how to structure that, how to finance that, and how to ensure that more people participate in the upside. But th those, are, those are all details. I mean, the, the big question I would put to you is, what choice do you have? What, what else is going to drive the American economy forward? One. Two, how are you going to prevent the next coronavirus from being even more devastating unless you invest even more in science and technology now? And, and three, where are you going to get the people? I mean, the ultimate you know, driver of, 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 the, of, of economic growth and of science and, and of applications of science is people. It's trained people. It's skilled people. If we're shutting down universities and, and cratering campuses, and in the aftermath of this, um, you know, disaster, uh, those consequences are going to be very long lived. That's pushing us massively the other way. And, and I, I fear that that is a substantial uh, part of the current dynamic. So I, I say, go the other way, invest, reap the returns, make sure the upside is shared. You know, you don't have to do exactly what, what John Gruber and I said, but pushing in that direction is going to seem more appealing 
to more people over, 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 over time. And that's positive. And that, that's a strategy. That, that's what we did before uh, in this country. That's what we did really well, actually, during World War II, after World War II, into the, into the 50s and even into the 60s. And, and we lost our way on, on that strategy for no particularly good reason. Um, it, you know, we took our eye off the ball. Other, other issues distracted us. Um, and the politics got in the way. Okay, fine. But what option do you have? Well, where else are you going to get your growth? Where are the good jobs going to come from? What's going to drive the economy forward? I, I think you need a catalyst. You'll get much better results if you uh, allow and encourage the government to make these investments and you find ways to generate more private enterprise coming out of those, of, of those, of those ventures. Um, and um, the, the only other thing I would say, and then we can take a couple more questions, Megan, before we end is, to get us from here to there. So here's, 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 the, here's the crisis, here's the attempt to reboot and, and the struggle to recover. And down, down you know, one or two years down the road, I, I'm, I'm envisaging more jump-starting and more investment and, and more consistent um, performance uh, and, and, and improved economic prospects. How do we get from here to there? Well, I, I think we have to um, apply ourselves much more uh, in, in, a, in a more organized and unified way to uh, the problems of COVID-19. And, and this fall, I'm gonna be offering a course uh, at um, MIT, joint with co colleagues, including in engineering, and, and across, so it's a cross-campus course, uh, focused on uh, any and all uh, projects we can find that try to help people, communities, businesses, governments, uh, navigate their way to recovery. The, the code name for this course is the COVID Smackdown course. I, I suspect MIT will not want that to be the official name of the course, but you get the general idea. And we're gonna be looking for projects, we're gonna be looking for partners, we're looking for ideas. Uh, Johnson at mit.edu is my email or reach me through Megan and, and David, they can forward it to me at any time. We will be delighted to um, talk with you about how to develop partnerships and how to find projects that the students can work on. Because MIT students wanna, be engaged. They want to lean forward and they want to help all of us get through this, this difficult phase. And I think that's an education in itself, helping and, and bringing to bear the tools and the analytics and the ideas of undergraduates and graduate students working together in, in a fashion that at least I haven't seen in, um, in, in, in 35 years at, uh, at, at MIT. So um, Megan, any, any final questions you want me to address before we close out? Just, just a couple. Um, well, one question that uh, campus, yeah, given with the things uh, reopening at uh, different speeds in different places, um, do you think a, a second wave would be uh, worse than the first one? Or better, about the same? Well, look, I think it depends on what you do, Megan. Um, yeah. I think that um, we're, we're better prepared now. We're less likely to panic. I think we can develop, we have a better sense of, of what we need to measure and we're bringing the testing capacity uh, online. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, our group's working on serology, other people have, have made amazing steps on, on, on uh, PCR tests, for example, including the Broad Institute in, in Boston or in Cambridge. Um, so I think those are all uh, factors in, in our, uh, to our advantage. Um, could it still go badly wrong? Could we have a, a surge of infection? And, and a crashing of the hospital system. I think it's less likely, but I'm, I'm not gonna say it's impossible. So I think we gotta be careful. And I think Massachusetts will be careful. So that's, that's good news. Yeah, I'm just thinking, I know I was talking with some friends and we're, they're all talking about, you know, when, when everything gets back to normal and it's gonna be a huge party. And I was thinking, no, no, please don't. <laughs> please, please don't run out in the street and have a huge party. That would be, that would be bad. Um, yeah, and just, uh, a, well, a question from, from me, um, you know, about, uh, yeah, talking about uh, Vannevar Bush and his, um, and his uh, proposals to get the country, um, to get the economy and to uh, build the nation's capacity for uh, research for science and engineering after World War II. Um, I mean, a lot of that was, uh, you know, the parts of his proposal that were enacted uh, came about because the, the at that time, the federal government was in a position and was and had leaders that were that were willing and able and had the uh, sort of the, the buy-in to be able to invest uh, large amounts of, of uh, capital, both political and economic capital, um, in building um, 
you know, building giant research institutes uh, like the NIH, the NSF, and uh, NASA. Um, do you think that uh, do you think that political situation is um, in the political climate that we're in right now? Do you think that we're still that that would such a such a an investment would be possible in order to get to <laughs> sorry. Well, yes, uh, not not at this moment, <laughs> Megan. But look, politics comes and goes, and and, and so yes, political yes. figures. And uh, you know, the good thing about the uh, U.S. politics is we we move on, and typically. Uh, and I, I do think that there is, you know, so so I, I wasn't born in the United States, as, as as you may have guessed from my accent, but I am very proud to have been an American citizen for 20 years. And and what I like about the American system compared to, for example, the British system, is that um, there's a pragmatism to the American uh, American politics and there's a confronting of reality. And I think when, I think it was actually Churchill who said when the Americans always do the right thing after first exhausting all the other possibilities. So we're running out of other possibilities. Megan. Yes. Yeah, well. But science, look, sci look, science will not save us. Science doesn't save us, but science can help us help us save ourselves, right? If we, it, but it's how you use science and how you develop it and how you shape it. A lot of things went really well after World War II, but not everything. And I think we need to learn those lessons and internalize them and, 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 and much more carefully design a program of investment in science and, and, and related commercialization focused on more good jobs. That, that's my slogan, Megan, more good jobs. Because I think if you get more good jobs, a lot of other things fall into place. And that's not what we've been focused on the past couple of decades. <laughs> no. Um, yes, although I am, that's very, so selfishly, I'm hoping that this might uh, get people to rethink the open plan office. That's, um, uh, I think that's going to keep me out of the office for a while. Uh, uh, what do you think is the likelihood of expanding access to PPE to the general public instead of pursuing more lockdowns of, of uh, vulnerable people? Uh, PPE and universal masking has been very effective in limiting infection rates and mortality among healthcare workers. So. Yes, it has. And, and I think if we could scale up the availability of really good uh, PPE, that would be immensely helpful. I think the concerns from people who follow the supply chain uh, carefully is that we don't have, we, we, that members of the public, non-healthcare workers should not be buying medical grade PPE. And so there's other guidance about cloth masks of various kinds and how to make them better and safer. I think that, at, you know, at some point, there may be more PPE and maybe more domestic PPE to be, to provide a high degree of protection. I do think we've learned some important lessons about that and there's going to be some further reflection, but let's not take the PPE away from them and any healthcare uh, worker, including nursing homes right now, please. Yeah, um, I had a question. Uh, can you say a bit about the current state of R&D on tests that are easy to self-administer, give a rapid and highly sensitive answer, and are readily available in large quantities at inexpensive prices? Uh, that's basically, <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, and the unicorn. Um, that's basically what I need to, to reopen my in-person practice. Uh, questioner is a, a psychologist. Um, yes, yeah, so, so there are some. There is a rapid antigen test that's just been approved by the FDA. Um, there are some other there are other technologies or other competing versions that are under development. I think they do have the potential to be extremely helpful. Um, but so does the fact that PCR testing is going to become more readily available and and it's going to be easier and less intrusive to to swab uh, or to take the specimen. So I think testing at large uh, quantities is going to come. Uh, I, oh, I I think it also the speed at which that you get the result is going to be key. So the, the one advantage of rapid antigen tests, mm -hmm. depending on, on um, the accuracy of the test, which I don't believe is fully established yet, at least I haven't seen the, the conclusive evidence, um, that, that those results can, could tell you immediately uh, at, at the point of care, like in your home at the beginning of the day, whether or not you yeah, uh, have, have the virus. Yeah, the uh, question is basically what I need as a professional and as a parent is a thing where I can say, spit on this Q-tip, wait 15 minutes, and if it's purple, go home. Yeah, so that may come. I mean, there are people working on that. There's some very good people working on that. I don't think it's been completely cracked yet, um, but that certainly could be, certainly might come and could be helpful. I think the, um, the big money is going to PCR testing and scaling up PCR testing, but that is with the exception of the Abbott rapid test kits that are hard to get, um, that those tests you, you, uh, take you know, six to eight hours right now. And they take, yeah, and then they're not 
not something you could do at home. They, they require, yeah. It's a lab test, right? Yeah, that's a lab test that requires. Do you think, how do you think COVID-19 will have permanently transformed higher education and uh, for the better? Um, how, is it, how has MIT collaborated in scientific efforts with uh, Harvard and other universities? Okay, uh, you've been a great crowd. Time for me to go home now. <laughs> uh, no, I think we'll make this the last question. Uh, okay. I, think, uh, I, I think, you know, I don't think COVID-19, I think we're going to claim, uh, look back and say COVID-19 improved anything. I think it just, it's a massive stress test for everything and, and a lot of cracks have appeared. Um, I, I have certainly seen plenty of uh, cooperation and, and um, we cooperate in our group uh, with, with a number of people at uh, Harvard Public Health, for example, uh, Brigham Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, uh, I'm sure there's many other forms of cooperation going on across different uh, institutions. I think everyone is scrambling and has scrambled, uh, Megan, and we've done the best that we can. I think going forward, it's going to be very interesting to see what forms of cooperation we can develop and sustain. And yes, I, I do take the point from the question that more of that would be good. And I think MIT brings a lot uh, to, the, to the mix, but doesn't have a medical school um, and it doesn't have a school of public health. And so I think those kinds of partnerships are very natural for us to find. Well, that yes, it is. It is uh, yes. It's after eight thirty, so um, yes, I think we should probably um, wrap this up. And I'd like to thank you very much. This has been just really fantastic, very insightful. And um, yeah, we'll be uh, getting the we'll be posting the uh, recording of the full uh, seminar on the uh, club's YouTube channel for those who may have missed the beginning. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Good luck. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Megan. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Stay safe. Yes, you too.